can do that by producing smart, small, simple, cost-effective energy management tools that strengthen the relationship between consumers and utilities and solve the energy problems we face. Well, we've been around for about a year and a half. Uh, the three founders, myself, Tom Kennedy, and Seth Barry Thompson, were working together at an engineering company here in New York called Kennedy Robotics, which is doing some very cool stuff uh, for aerospace robotics, building things for NASA. Um, there's some hardware on Mars and some more buildings to it. So it was a good place to be, but we found uh, ourselves sort of tasked with trying to find benevolent uh, work working for the Department of Defense, because NASA is, you know, has a big little customer. Starting in the summer of 2007, Seth started to look around at other things uh, that might be able to do with time and um, wanted to become part of this sort of clean tech movement. We started in the fall, really kind of taking it seriously, and we uh, building up this idea around making these devices to kind of measure and control the amount of, electric pe amount of electricity people use in their homes, sort of inspired by the Toyota Prius and these kinds of feedback systems that give you more information about how you're using electricity so that you can actually, or use energy so you can actually kind of improve your behavior around them. Um, and looking at a residential kind of setting to do that. Uh, so we started, um, we got a grant, we applied for a grant from NYSERDA, which is the New York State Energy Research and Development Authority. Um, and when we were awarded that grant in December, sort of had the courage to quit the job, open an office in Gowanus, and start the work of actually uh, designing and building these systems. In a nutshell, what our systems do is they, they're plug-in power strips, I mean, sort of on the, on the micro scale, they're things you plug into your appliances into that can measure and wirelessly report the amount of electricity they're being used to uh, a hub, a device that can then uh, report that information to you, bridge that information to mobile platforms, online platforms, and in-home displays, and also facilitate a two-way communication with the utility company, which is something I'll get more to in a little bit later. So we were trying to address you know, problems, needs that really exist, and um, this first one, obviously, Climate change is something I'm probably preaching to the choir about here, and there's better PowerPoint presentations out there that explain, you know, all the different ways that uh, the environment is hurting. And um, but there are a couple of factoids I kind of wanted to show that are maybe more relevant to this. But what you see here is um, the various sectors of activity of industry, or you know, there's transportation, um, electricity, other fuel in the United States going through the different kind of end use scenarios um, and ultimately to the green the resulting greenhouse gases that uh, that come from all of that um, and what you see is that buildings residential and commercial buildings account for about 25 percent of the carbon emissions that the United States produces which is about two percent less than cars so you know buildings are a great opportunity to try to kind of make some improvements this is another one that shows forms of energy uh, that are produced in the United States so you see coal, natural gas, crude oil, only 7% are renewable. And if you include nuclear, it's only 15% of real clean energy uh, production. And nuclear is kind of controversial in that. And again, on the other side, on the output, you can see that um, residential energy consumption accounts for you know, a full 20% of, uh, of the energy used in the United States. So um, it's a pretty good opportunity to show, make, a, make a difference. Second problem is something that is kind of a little harder for a little less well understood, but it's the peak demand problem. Like utility companies don't make necessarily more money by selling more electricity. In fact, in a lot of states, and here in New York including, um, they're decoupled, which means that they, their profits, they have, they're, you know, a, they're a regulated monopoly essentially, so they answer to uh, state agencies. Their profits are made from providing affordable, safe, and reliable electricity, not necessarily providing more electricity. The grid is built to handle the uh, demand during the peak times. So like in the hot summer afternoon is when, you know, you need the peaker plants to fire up. But for most of the year, for less than more than 90%, like it's not actually using full capacity. So what, and you have these cycles like, like the previous chart um, uh, presenter showed that, that it's in the electric company's interest to actually kind of try to lower the peaks and raise the valleys so that there's kind of a more efficient use of energy. There's kind of a safety margin that they have to uh, maintain to provide uh, reliable power to the, to the user, and that's determined by the regulators. And what this 
slide is showing is the anticipated year by which that, that safety margin is going to disappear. So there's a pretty, and you can see that some of those years are, in some of the regions of the country, it's quite soon. So there's a strong need from the utility side to kind of reduce the amount of electricity people use in a way. The third problem, which is kind of more of an opportunity, is like from the user perspective of like, how, what does all this mean to them, to the, to the user, and, uh, and you know, what are their concerns and responsibilities, what can people actually do about it, and what kind of tools can help. And from sort of the design perspective, uh, these are all kind of great opportunities and sort of the fun part. But the first kind of problem we identified is information gap. So if you're getting a single, single bill from your electric company at the end of the month with, you know, in kilowatt hours with adjustments and the dollar amount assigned to it, it's not exactly enough information to be actionable. And in addition to that, we all kind of know the price of electricity is going up all the time. Another problem is kind of just the general inefficiencies in homes and in appliances that we're using. Um, you know, this factoid kind of there's a range, but you know, vampire power accounts for you know five or five to twenty percent losses depending upon who you ask. Um, it's kind of an easy, that's kind of low hanging fruit. Um, another big problem is thermostats. Uh, programmable thermostats have been around for 25 years. They've been shown to actually, uh, when they're programmed properly, can reduce the amount of money you spend on your heating and cooling by up to 25%, but three quarters of them are never actually programmed the right way. So it's kind of a design opportunity to improve on that. New homes, like this thing mansion, are oversized, but they're probably better insulated than older homes. Um, but obviously there's plenty of uh, opportunities to kind of improve with in all of those cases. And the other opportunity here is that people kind of want to be greener. I mean, we all know that really what motivates people is money, so there's an opportunity to kind of help people save money, but also there's plenty of evidence that shows that uh, there's kind of an awareness about um, being more responsible to the environment. Um, there's a random statistic here from uh, GFK Roper's Green Gauge report that says that, you know, the full quarter of the world, 25% of the world's population lists the environment as their number one concern, which is kind of heartening. I mean, it's sad, but it's, it means that people actually are starting to care a little bit more about this year over year. And the solution is uh, to try to align the goals of the consumers, the utility companies, and the planet. And uh, that's exactly what Energy Hub is trying to do with our products. Um, but I also should mention we're not kind of alone. We're part of uh, some bigger, some bigger uh, efforts that are also already underway that we are going to be kind of working along with. And that's this idea of the smart grid, which is essentially um, the idea of replacing this 100-year-old infrastructure with updated, modern, networked computing power. There are a lot of benefits that come from that. I mean, part of like the old system is, that's kind of archaic even is that you know, one example of that is, you know, there's the guy that has to drive his truck to your house to look at a mechanical meter and write that down and take it back. And other things, like, if there actually is a power failure in a neighborhood, like a lot of utility companies currently are trying to locate the problem by looking at where the phone calls that are making complaints are coming from. They don't actually have any kind of direct means of being able to figure that out. The smart grid, it, it's going to enable a bunch of things, um, including, uh, you know, forward-looking ideas like distributed storage, you know, driving, you can imagine electric cars having these large batteries so that rather than having a blackout, you could actually get the utility company to pull power. You could sell your electricity stored in your batteries back to the, back to the grid if that would actually help. Um, there's uh, other things like demand response, which is the idea that they could, that you would actually, rather than have a blackout, have things turned off, you know, shed, watts, um, megawatts, um, that's something that already exists kind of commercially, which, uh, you know, so there are third-party companies that set up contracts with uh, participating, you know, hotels or factories or whatever that um, when they get the call from the utility company, they have their clients on call to be able to actually shed load to avoid a blackout to the grid. And with uh, a networked communicating two-way system between the utility company and residential customers, you could kind of scale that up, not having like phone calls going from one company to another, but messages being broadcast that would effectively give homeowners rebates or price incentives to turn down their thermostat and do these kinds of things. Um, but for all of that, you're kind of going to need uh, better tools to communicate in real time with the uh, utility company. How does Energy Hub fit in? We are going to provide easily understandable information about your own energy use, um, 
two-way communications with the utility company, like about how much you're using and how much electricity is kind of cost at that moment. Um, and then additionally, automation tools so that you can kind of schedule and turn things on and off in a way that is more energy efficient and also participate in something like residential demand response. Um, and then also we're going to be gathering, obviously, a lot of data, and that data itself can be used for, you know, informing or educating their homeowner about their own use kind of in a broader, more, in a broader, more powerful way, and then also anonymizing that data and kind of looking at it kind of in a larger sense and context. What Energy Hubs tries to do, and me as the design director and the advocate for the users, try to make this a system that people will want to use and kind of really looking at it from the user's point of view um, and making sure that it's a system that they would want to use. It's a product that doesn't exist yet, you know, so there's, or it's not a product, but it's uh, a technology that doesn't even exist yet. And, but it's coming and there's, there's an opportunity to make something that people would want so long as you kind of address all of their needs. And to do that, um, we have uh, kind of from the start, you know, as a smaller startup, kind of in a scrappy way, doing best practices design um, as we get user-centric design. Um, and we started, you see here are some user probes that we, uh, I put together with my friend and great designer and design researcher, Margot Jacobs, uh, where we made essentially coloring books, disposable cameras, questionnaires, and sent them out to 20 families across the country to kind of capture their relationship to their energy, the technology in their home, and uh, their kind of feelings towards the environment and try to call that information into uh, you know, some user personas so we're actually designing for specific people throughout. Um, these are just some examples of you know, what, we, uh, what we were able to do. Ultimately, you know, putting our, that research into real designs of the interfaces and of the devices and of the services and um, testing them in small groups just to kind of uh, verify our assumptions and um, make sure that we're, uh, we're, uh, we're, we're going to be able to, we're making products that people want to use. Um, there was a kind of a great book that we used for kind of organizing these kind of user tests. Uh, it's called Don't Make Me Think by Steve Krug. It's a very good tool for kind of figuring out in, you know, not statistically significant samples, but being able to do user testing in a way where you really kind of get at the, the big problems very quickly and kind of narrow in on the smaller ones. Um, and we were able to do that you know, a number of times throughout the process and continue to do so. So it's kind of an iterative process towards making sure that we're doing it right. And these cliches are something kind of from graduate school days at Stanford Product Design Program that uh, at the time I just didn't really realize how useful they would actually be. Finally, I just kind of wanted to shout out uh, a bunch of organizations and certifications and things that have come across my research that are really about making, uh, making sure we're doing, we're doing um, the best we can. Um, Designers Cord is uh, an organization uh, that kind of, it's a manifesto essentially for designers to, you know, engage their clients in ways of uh, making sure that they're uh, using, that, they're, that their solutions are addressing some environmental concerns and that they are in their own offices are kind of doing best practices. Uh, B Corporation is a is a, a way of forming a company that has a triple bottom line so that your environmental and your social and your business needs are all, or requirements are all sort of being met. Um, cradle to Cradle is like looks at the physical stuff of stuff and makes sure that the entire life cycle of a product is kind of um, responsibly handled by the, by the producer. EPEAT is kind of like the lead standard for electronics, so you know you're kind of getting uh, a uh, when you're buying a computer, something that um, it, uh, you know, it, it's as energy efficient as it could be. Um, energy Star, you probably know. O2NYC is a great organization here in New York. Uh, Sustainable Minds is a life cycle analysis software program that is kind of geared towards designers. So you can kind of look at design decisions in context and see, kind of rank what the uh, environmental outcomes of that are going to be ultimately. It's been very useful. Um, and uh, yeah, ROSE is a European standard that's now kind of international almost to make sure that uh, harmful chemicals aren't in your electronics. Um, so those are all kind of tools. And I, can, I should say, it's, you know, Energy Hub might not necessarily be able to meet all of those very rigorous standards, but it's something that is kind of a hippie in residence I kind of enjoy looking and I get to be the advocate for in our company. Um, so thanks. Thank you.